This week on Capitol Report, environmental activist urging Governor Lamont to call a special session on climate change. You're suggesting these weather anomalies are going to continue? Not just continue, get worse. Plus, debate over President Biden's executive order on border crossings. Sorry, folks, parks closed. The moose out front should have told you. Also, will UConn coach Dan Hurley leave stores for the Lakers and LeBron? I'm going to make him an offer again. Well, UConn locks down Geno for five more years. The show goes on! Follow the bouncing ball. Capital Report starts now. Welcome to Capital Report. I am Tom Dutchick. We are so glad you're spending part of this Sunday morning. Listen to the Power Panel. The Mayor of Bloomfield, Connecticut, ranking number two on golf week's um, oh, yeah. Winter Every Berry year. Hills. Huh? Yes. Did you hit him there? I do. Come on over. Right, let's go. Well, Joe's a good hitter. Huh, Joe? Uh, I, don't, I don't know, but Kenny Park was there, Kenny too. Kenny Park was which number one. Yeah. Yes, Duran was nothing in Trumbull. Nothing it, in Fairfield. Uh, I live in Fairfield, but my, my husband's probably playing as we speak. Oh, love it. <laughs> Kenny, a uh, uh, 14, 15, right? Breaking news. I'm not leaving. <laughs> I'm staying here. All right, guys, so as we inch closer to summer, one of the big questions at the state capitol is when lawmakers will be called back for a special session. According to the Connecticut Mirrors, our pal Mark Pazniokas says Connecticut's environmentalists are pushing their Democratic allies to address climate change as they also tackle issues on car tax and banking issues. A bill that would have declared a climate crisis in Connecticut passed the House but died in the Senate last session. The bill laid out steps for reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Mirror reports that Senate President Marty Looney doesn't want to touch it until next session, but the executive director of the Connecticut League of Conservation Voters tells Paz, quote, if they don't pass it, we're going to beat them up. We've told them that. Feelings are mixed on this panel. What do you think, Joe? Are you going to get it done? No. no. Um, it's not going <laughs> to be done. No. Um, it, the numbers aren't there. It was going to be a fight up in the Senate. There are senators, Democratic senators, have listed out their position on it. So the votes are close there. Getting out of the House wasn't exactly easy. There was some arm twisting. There was language that people found objectionable. There's no way it gets called in a special session. And I spoke to some of the folks that are really pushing it. They're like, it's not a great build to begin with. Why don't we just come back next year and start it again? Yeah, I mean, one of the dirty little secrets at the end of session was that the Senate Democrats were never going to call this bill, and they ended up spending their last uh, hours on a striking workers bill that they knew Governor Lamont was going to veto. Um, look, the governor supports this bill. He said he'd sign this bill, um, but he's got to work with Speaker Ritter. He's got to work with uh, Senator Looney, the president of the Senate. He can't just call this in for a special session. Um, Speaker Ritter, rightfully, Joe, you've been in this position. If he wants to put this on the special session list, then 10 other legislators are going to say, well, we want our bills on yep. the special session list. So I don't think it's going to happen in special session. Um, we'll see if Senator Looney has a better bill for next session or if they call it uh, in a November lame duck session. Um, but that, my last point is, that really is saying this is political. I've got people who don't want to vote on this bill before the election, and I think that's a bad look. Yeah, I think that, you know, is it going to happen? Probably not. Should it? Absolutely. You know, we've been sitting on our hands for far too long as it relates to climate and mm -hmm. energy. And I say it all the time. We are behind the eight ball when it comes to getting Connecticut where yeah. they need to be and establishing the goals together. Uh, so, you know, the governor in a Bloomfield community, a senior community, and got called out and got urged to potentially get something on this session immediately, right? And so it's not just the younger generations. It's not just the progressive lefts that are pushing climate it's the senior communities that see that we again are falling behind as a state in the nation so we got to figure something out yeah right now. the dynamics are interesting though when you when you read the comments from the league um, you know they're really sort of like pumping their chest like they're going to do something well they they don't really have a, a lever to pull there right I mean they're not going to primary these Democrats. The opportunity for that closes on Tuesday because you'd have to go get signatures. So they'd have to really get aggressive on that front. And are they really going to go and call these folks out in an election year? Or are they just going to wait and see what happens, right? I mean, if, if Democrats don't do well in the election, I think you'll see it come up in a lame duck session. If, they, if things stay the same or if they, they grow their roles, I think you'll see this 
get a they'll, they'll advocate for a better bill coming into the new year. Okay, right, so last week President Biden took the extreme steps of issuing an executive order to allow for temporary closures of the U.S.-Mexico border. The move is an effort to cap the number of migrants looking to enter the U.S., with some exceptions for unaccompanied minors. Immigration and border is one of the most contentious issues heading towards November. Some Democrats, including Connecticut Senator Chris Murphy, aren't in love with the plan. Murph saying, quote, I am sympathetic to the position the administration is in, but I am skeptical. The executive branch has the legal authority to shut down asylum processing between ports of entry on its own. Meaningful asylum reform requires a bipartisan solution in Congress. Guys, the Murph tried the bipartisan solution, didn't go as expected, and here we are again. This is something that the president uh, is responsible for. It was his action when he came into office that got us to this place, that led to this crisis. Um, this is too little, too late. It's clearly a political move. They're heading into a presidential election year. He knows this is on the minds of uh, voters in every state. Every community is now a border community because of what... Uh, President Biden has done. And so I think when you look at this, I mean, sure, we have legislative action. The House passed H.R. 2 a year ago, uh, and the Senate has failed to take it up. There have been several border bills that have come up in the House uh, that the Senate could take action on, and they refuse to do it. So I think voters see through this. The polls show voters see through this. Um, and I think that uh, Senator Murphy is right. This does require legislative action, and the Senate can do something about it. See, but the issue that frustrates me the most about this, and I don't get frustrated often, well, I guess I do. <laughs> I know you all can laugh. But the bill was on the table, and politics did get involved. You had the disgraced former president come out and say, do not pass it. I want it to be an election day issue, when it was a bipartisan answer that our own Chris Murphy spent days, weeks, months negotiating to come up with an answer. Do I like what Biden's doing? No, but it's something. If we're acknowledging the problems there in our anemic uh, federal officials can't do anything about it. We have to do something. It should have been acted upon. Shame on Donald Trump for ever stepping into the middle of it and saying it needed to not pass. Well, Joe, the problem is this has been political lo long before yeah. Donald Trump. Uh, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama were for a fence around our border. Donald Trump called it a wall and all of a sudden they were against it. The far left and the far right have killed immigration reform. We need to remember that Ronald Reagan mm -hmm. Gave, a, gave an amnesty deal for better controls. I watch these people coming over the border in the videos. And you know, most of these people coming to America because they want a better life. That's the American dream. That's what our country promises. The problem is nobody's being vetted, so we don't know who's coming through. We need real leadership to bring in more legal aliens and less illegal aliens. And I fear it's not gonna happen in our political environment, either from the left or the right. No, agreed. I think that if we don't find an uh, amicable solution to help those that need asylum and true asylum, implementing bills like this, which actually does mirror a uh, page out of Trump's book, which is the ban on Muslim countries mm -hmm. in 2017, this is kind of very dangerous. What it does do is allow ev everyone over under 18 to cross uh, without parents. And it's going to have an increase in the children that are coming to seek real asylum that don't have the credentials or the safety measures to get here. And so I don't agree with it. I know something needs to happen. Happen. It is his responsibility to secure our borders, but we have to do it the right way, and it's it's Congress and it's the Senate's fault. That's a great point. Right, next on Sports Talk, hey, basketball isn't usually part of our political discussion, but this one too good to pass up. After back-to-back -back national championships, the L.A. Lakers want Danny Hurley, and the words describing the contract offer is massive. The Lakers are arguably the most popular NBA franchise. Kareem, Magic, Shaq, Kobe, LeBron. Now it seems Hurley may get the chance to hightail it out of stores for showtime, baby. As of Friday morning, Hurley was mum on the issue, but a couple of guys who know a thing or two about basketball did way in on Hurley's potential departure. I don't know what's going on, and it'd be a bad day for UConn, for sure, if this happens, and it would be a great, great day for Dan Hurley, and a, I'm sure a bittersweet day for Dan Hurley. I truly understand that it's, it's going to be a family decision. What he's done, he's picked up the, uh, you know, he's picked up the rope and, started, and, and keeps pulling up the mountain, and I'm proud of him, and, you know, I understand that, but personally, Jim Calhoun, I want him to stay. Well, well, well. Very interesting, guys, huh? Very, very, very interesting. Look, look, what he's done for our basketball program, we can't salute him enough. He's probably in the position to where his heart is saying, I love it here, I love these kids, I want to go for the three-peat. But his head is saying, this is, this is lifetime wealth. This is a game changer. It is the Lakers. I wouldn't want to be in his shoes. I hope he stays. 
but it's not looking so good. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens, right? I mean, obviously with the uh, transfer portal and NIL deals, we've already seen UConn lose a top recruit coming out of Maine uh, that went to Duke instead of coming to UConn because of NIL opportunities. So because of all of that, it really changes the dynamic of what this team looks like next year and, and in the years after. Um, so obviously huge uh, implications for the state too because as a, we're all uh, impacted by this. I think what we're all going to wonder is what is this going to do for Connecticut, to your point, Liz, what it's going to do for recruitment efforts, what it's going to do for the uh, financial situation at the institution, UConn, and how is uh, Dan's um, stay or departure going to impact that, you know. But look, the door's open. We were talking earlier, um, John, if the door is open, you got to walk through it. This is a once in a lifetime chance. Would I prefer he go to Boston? Sure, because I'm a Boston <laughs> fan. Thank but, you. Uh, Amen. But, you know, once in a yeah, lifetime. It's a, it's a great point. I mean, we're a political show, right? Some politicians want higher office, but they sit around and wait for the perfect time, and it never comes. Others, like Chris Murphy, jump in early, run against Nancy Johnson. That's what I want to do. I'm going to go grab it. Dan Hurley's got to go grab it. Mm. Yeah, and Please then, don't say that. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and on Friday, the news came out. It looked like you know the men, you know the, in the the odds for the national championships plummeted without without Hurley in the, doing the team. Well, yeah. and what does the program sustain, right? What has he built that we can continue to improve upon? Has he created um, you know an environment at UConn where you know it's going to leave it better than he he uh, got there with, or is yes. he going to end up taking yeah. everything with him and the and the and the program is done. Well, so you should do welfare checks on all the Ritters. <laughs> yeah. I, I have been. <laughs> all right, guys, much like our weather, the primary season heating up. There could be more, if you can believe that, legal battles in Bridgeport. Up next on Cap Report, we'll get some insights from our own, the kid, Mike Cerulli. We get back. Do not go away. Shocked. 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 Wow, Shocked. who saw that coming? Shocked. Who saw that coming, huh? <laughs> not me. summer that means one thing it's primary season baby and if you thought you were in for a boring low energy time this summer well think again a lawsuit brewing in where else <laughs> Bridgeport could affect some high profile <laughs> primaries around the state our news aides political contributor our pal Mike Surley joins us with the details Mike you're going to be spending some more time in Bridgeport's uh, courtroom this summer you should just get a room down there Mike good morning Tom it definitely seems possible that that's where we're headed, Bridgeport State Senator Heron Gaston is raising the alarm about an error made by the Secretary of the State's office. Now, here's what happened as we know it. State law says that candidates who want to petition to get on primary ballots in those multi-town House and Senate districts, well, they have to get their petition sheets from the Secretary of the State's office beginning on the 77th day preceding the day of the primary. This year, that 77th day was May 28th. But a spokeswoman for Secretary Thomas told me and other reporters that multiple petitioning candidates got those sheets too early and some started collecting signatures too early due to an error made by personnel inside the secretary's office. Candidates affected by that mistake include incumbent Bobby Gibson, who is petitioning to get on the primary ballot to keep his seat, and Abdul Osmanu, who is petitioning for Robin Porter's seat. Now, this doesn't mean that everyone who got those sheets early went out and got signatures early. But in the case of Senator Gaston's district, his challenger, Ernie Newton, got the petition sheets about two weeks before they were supposed to be made available, and he did commence his signature campaign before May 28th. Max, here's the big question. Are those signatures going to count? That is the big question. Now, Senator Gaston is prepping legal action to invalidate those pre-May 28th signatures, but Secretary Thomas's spokeswoman said they intend to accept pre-May 28th signatures, in large part because there doesn't seem to be a good way to tell when a signature was actually signed. Believe it or not, you don't need to date your signature on a petition sheet. So at this point, it's not really clear how a court could determine which signatures to invalidate, even if that court agreed with Gaston's argument that the ones collected too early should be tossed. So to go back to your original question, yes, it does seem likely we'll be back in court because of a primary election in Bridgeport. And based on what I've been hearing, I think this is just the start of what could be a very another, another very layered story involving our elections here in Connecticut.
Next, we're really a member of the Jelly of the Month Club when it comes to Bridgeport politics. <laughs> yeah, it's the, the gift that keeps on giving the whole year, Clark. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Mike. See you soon in Bridgeport. Great to be here. Up next on Cap Report, the debate over armed citizen patrols. We'll discuss what's happening in two of Connecticut's biggest cities when we get back. Don't go away. It's never a bad time. <laughs> it's a Christmas vacation. There you go. Clark. to New Haven won't become reality anytime soon. Leaders who started this movement in Hartford came to New Haven to talk about this, uh, the city chief police and mayor last Wednesday. But after a 30-minute meeting, the self-defense brigade leaders decided to put the proposal on hold. Watch this. We see their willingness to work with the community, to work with those whose ideas they do not share. They're opposed to, they're opposed to armed patrol, but they're willing to sit down and have open dialogue for the interests of their people. We don't see this in Hartford, and it speaks to the maturity of the mayor here and the police chief, and the lack of willingness and maturity of Mayor Arunin up in Hartford. And we talked about listening to the community and doing what the community needs. Um, I just feel like the armed brigade isn't as trained as well as officers. It adds another person into the mix with a gun. Um, and it, for them to come down here, it would be people who don't know the streets of New Haven. Now we had a spirited discussion during the break uh, leading into this block on this, Danielle, uh, but crime is down across the state of Connecticut, right? Well, well, crime is down. How we feel about crime, to your point, Liz, is not, right? And mm -hmm. so it's really going to come down to do residents feel safe and what are the implications of implementing something like an armed force that are not the police? You know, what are the regulation implications? What are the legal implications? Who's responsible for misuse? Who's going to be the oversight? Who is going to fund these items? Um, so I, I do think it's a relevant conversation as we move into uh, less people going into the police force who are going to keep the um, you know community safe but it's a larger conversation again with the politicians with the the residents with the communities that feel that this is a need why do they feel it's a need and what can we do in the interim to solve that problem is it unheard of no I think that you know more conversations we could think about what that looks like and how to make it happen uh, safely you, you have um, volunteer firefighters every day, right? Uh, we can figure out what that looks like, what kind of model. I think we have to have, uh, you know, our spirits a little calmer in that way, you know, but, you know, increase. But Liz, you have concerns, here. Liz. Well, yeah, I mean, listen, I think it bigger, the bigger issue here is we, when we're constantly told that crime is down and there's no issue, the people in our communities, particularly in our state's largest municipalities, do not agree. We saw it, we talked about it in Bridgeport last week. We've seen this going on in Hartford for quite some time. Now we're looking at this situation in New Haven. And I'm sorry, but this is a direct result of the police bill that passed several years ago and the fact that we've continuously tied the hands of police officers at the state and local level and we're not able to safely patrol our streets and our communities and keep them safe um, and people feel the impact of that, whether it's response time or whether it's community policing and all of these things. Now, Joe, and we're going to have to continue since to make you passed that bill. Yeah, and I did. And, and, and part of it to me is, look, the body cams have been proven to really reinforce the officer's position on things that happen. The inspector general looks at it and they clear the officers. We're going to have these uh, not as well trained. I'll be nice about it. Individuals out there with guns, something's going to happen. The police are going to show up. There's going to be a dead body in two people and it's going to be well we say they did this others say they it's not going to work if you want to volunteer you want to help your city there's supernumerary positions you can apply for requires training we just can't have people running our streets with guns saying they're protecting us i want the police on my side Connecticut lost one of its bravest on May 30th and last Wednesday. State Trooper First Class Aaron Pelletier was laid to rest. His life taken by a hit and run driver while doing his job along I-84. Pelletier cherished his work as a state trooper and leaves a wife, two young sons. His loss, a reminder to all of us about the dangers our police face every day when they wear the uniform. McKinney, uh, Trooper Pelletier was a friend and colleague of your nephew. Yeah, uh, he was. Uh, my nephew Michael's a state trooper out of uh, Troop A. He's also a canine trooper, and all the canine troopers uh, yeah. train together every month. Um, and obviously, I, I know we all feel this way. Our, our hearts uh, and prayers go out to his family. 
Um, it's such a tragedy, and it's sadly, I don't even know why we as society need these reminders, but it is a reminder of just how brave the women and men who wear the uniform, whether it's our state police or our local police are, yeah. in protecting us every single day. Um, and it's a tragedy, and uh, I hope we won't see any more of these. Yeah. We'll be back with more Capitol Report in a minute. At age 70, with 11 national championships under his belt, you might think UConn's Gino Oriema would consider hanging it up. Well, think again. Oriema read up for another five years last week. The contract will pay Gino $18.7 million, and that doesn't include incentive. This will be year 40 at, uh, for Gino at UConn. As for the price tag, UConn's president says Gino's leadership has brought immeasurable value and name recognition to UConn and the entire state. I believe that, guys. Despite UConn not winning the women's national championship, since 16 is is anyone sour on five more years of the coach huh no, no. let's have let's <laughs> another 10 10 years he, he had a great line in his uh, doing a podcast with dan patrick he said look I took less on this five-year contract because I knew UConn needed more money to pay Hurley. And if Hurley goes, I'm going to cut my, I'm going to ask for another one. <laughs> I was thinking of recruiting him to run for governor. If Lamont doesn't run, I guess I'm out of luck now. Oh, yeah, you're not going to make Lamont friends in the summary. building with that one. Yeah. He's figured out the NIL deal, right? Yes. Like he's yeah. figured out how to deal with the transfer portal. He's figured out how to deal with NIL. He's worked out a way to, to continue to recruit top recruits to come to Connecticut. So. And he said they're winning a national yeah. championship and, next year. And he said, stop bullying Caitlin Clark. He did. And he has a great restaurant in Manchester. Why would he want to leave that? Exactly. He has two great restaurants in Manchester. One's at the <laughs> golf course. You should oh, go yes, that. that's true. <laughs> right there, there, the coach, Lizzie Jane, back on time. Thought you go see the All right, John, let's go. Speaking of basketball. Oh. <laughs> I talked to his backswing. Sorry. I'm going to retire.